Welcome to A Cup of Joe with Joe. We have a distinguished guest today. We have Betsy Pettit. Betsy Pettit is the managing partner and principal of Building Science Corporation. And we're going to talk about net zero energy houses and, and, and beyond. Uh, Betsy has a lot of experience with net zero energy houses and I'd like her to share some of the lessons that she's learned and, and, and give us some broad advice. Betsy, welcome. Thank you, Joe. I think I'd like to talk about the most interesting net zero house I worked on, which was a house that was done at the NIST facility in Gaithersburg, Maryland. It was called the NIST Net Zero Energy Research Test Facility. The first thing that we did was we worked on a set of drawings that very clearly uh, outlined our desires for air tightness and water management. And these were really the most important things about that project. First, we did a set of drawings that outlined in axonometric form how to put the uh, water barrier on the foundation walls. So we had a fully adhered water barrier on the outside face of the concrete. We then had a drainage mat, and then we had free-flowing backfill in addition to that. We covered, the, we covered those foundations at that point with a clay cap or, or a concrete sidewalk, depending on the situation. So that we created a great water management system for the basements areas. Above grade, we created boxes that were made out of wood studs. It's 24 inches on center. We sheathed the whole house and roof uh, with plywood, and then we added another fully adhered membrane over that. None of the overhangs were built onto that original box so that we knew that we had a box with a triangular roof, more or less, without any joints that air could leak in. Well, it sounds to me like you got to some ultra low levels of, of leakage with that kind of an approach. We did. So with that first test that we did, uh, before we put any of the windows in and before we added any of the outriggers to create the overhangs for the roof, that first test came in at 5 ACH 50. I you're out by an order of magnitude. I sorry, 0.5 ACH 50. Thank you're, you. <laughs> it was basically a German <laughs> level of performance. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. So that was a very good first thing to learn. So how do you get the basic air tightness? And that's what we did. Then well, we came back with well, the windows and put them in. You, but how did you do that? I mean, it seems to me that with that coating or membrane, you probably needed a bunch of insulation on the outside of that as well as on the inside. How do you make the windows work with something like that? Well, the, these windows were Audis, and mm -hmm. these windows were installed with clips, and um, so all of the extra return was on the inside. And that was basically because it looked right with this type of building. I, I think we always say that choice of whether you do any Audi or Tweeny windows just e is a style thing, and we can make all of them work. Let me translate that. An, an any window is a window that's to the inside of the thickness of the wall. An Audi window is to the outside of the thickness of the wall, and a Tweeny is in the middle. And with new construction, an Audi means that normal people, civilians walking by, have no idea how thick the wall is and how high performance a building it is. It just looks natural or normal. That's exactly right. Um, and so again, it is a design decision, but that's the way we did the windows. And really, after we put all the insulation, so we had insulating sheathing on the outside of the building, and we also filled the cavities with cellulose. So, so the cavities were filled with a it could have been cellulose, it could have been fiberglass, it could have been any chopped material, but we were trying to get full coverage in the cavities on the inside. On the outside, we used a foil-faced polyisocyanurate. We could have used any kind of rigid insulation on the outside, and then we uh, added furring strips and put on the siding. So we could have used, you could have used rock wool, uh, fiberglass, um, uh, 
extruded polystyrene, expanded polystyrene, the isocyanurate. So literally you could use any rigid or semi-rigid board on the outside and you can use any cavity insulation on the inside. So the choice of materials would be based on, 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 on what? It's going to be based on your personal preference, what you believe in, perhaps what you can get locally, uh, how you feel about the different ways that, manu that insulation is manufactured. And that, those judgments are really up to the people that are making the choices for that building. And the material choices could also relate to whether you want the wall to dry out or to dry in or to dry in both directions. You could have a barrier in the middle of the wall. You could have a flow-through assembly. So literally, that would be, I would view that as a universal approach. That's true. In this particular wall, because we used an, an impermeable fully adhered membrane, there was no drawing to the outside beyond the face of, of that membrane. And on the interior, uh, there was no polyethylene sheet. So we did have drawing to the inside from the inside face of the fully adhered membrane to the inside of the structure. Now so with, with all of this tightness, sorry to interrupt you, but <laughs> this has been a question of mine. You're a, you have an ultra tight building. How, how, how did we move air? How did you move air around in that building? And, and, and how do you deal with kitchen exhaust and dryers, for example, and, and fans and whatever? What, this is an, an, an amazingly tight building. How do you deal with those issues? Well, of course, the first decision that we made, and everybody agreed on, even though this was a test facility, there was going to be different equipment tested inside. But one thing we knew is we needed to have an ERV or an HRV in this. And so the building space ventilation system is a fully balanced HRV. And how did you handle the kitchen exhaust? The kitchen exhaust was uh, handled with an intermittent interlocked um, uh, fan that would allow intake of, of air every time the exhaust fan came on. That was also coupled with the, um, with the dryers. Oh, awesome. So mm -hmm. it, you were never overly positive or overly negative. You were balanced. Yes, for the most part, that, that's absolutely true. There were also exhaust fans in the bathrooms. Those exhaust fans were, uh, as the experiment went on, you know, there were people who were robots and those exhaust fans turned on like at <laughs> the time when you would have a shower in the morning or in the evening or something like that. And they, d they were not tied to uh, the makeup air. How, did, uh, how far did you get on the conservation and what, what renewable package did you ultimately end up going with? So there was a photovoltaic system on the roof and there was also a solar hot water system on, on the roof. The solar hot water system was actually uh, uh, put on over a conditioned space because that needs the warmth underneath it. The PVs were actually put up on a spacer so that they got air change underneath them and we got better performance. Uh, I believe there was 10K of PV on top of the roof and um, I can't remember right now the exact number for the, for the solar hot water, but in essence, over the years as this house was run with normal loads inside and trying to simulate normal loads inside, this house became net positive. How many square feet? The house is 2,700 square feet above grade and another 1,300 below grade. So we've got a, you came up? About 4,000 square feet when you count all of the condition space. Well, that's, that's pretty impressive. So uh, uh, not a small house with 10 kW of PV it has become a net positive energy uh, house at an ultra high level of of air tightness. Close out by telling us what the thermal levels were and, 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 and what your recommendations in general are. Well, so we kept the house at 70 um, during the winter and 68 to 70, or sorry, 72 for the summertime. There was a, a dehumidifier when it was needed. There was never any humidification needed. 
um, and uh, the comfort levels were kept basically according to the ASHRAE comfort standard. So we're not the robots were not uncomfortable? No, those robots were very happy. Tell me about the R values and, and, and close out by your what you came up with in terms of the rec general recommendations. Okay. Well, these are 1, 5, 10, 20, 40, 60. And let me explain. ACH 50 at 1, R5 for the windows, R10 for the below grade, below slab insulation, R20 for the below grade walls insulation, R40 for the above grade walls insulation, and R60 for the roof insulation. Those are general numbers, but it's easy to remember 1, 5, 10, 20, 40, 60. So that's what this house is. And, and if you come with a balanced <laughs> HRV and 10 kWPV from climate zones 3 to 6, you're net zero. Pretty good shape. Yep. Well, thank you for. Oh, and I want to tell people where they can go to, <laughs> to see the papers. You've always had the last word with me. <laughs> you need to go to the NIST Zero Energy Research Test Facility. If you Google that, there's all kinds of papers and uh, that you can see, research papers and things that have been looked at over time on this house. Thank well, you. Ms. Pettit, thank you very much. You're welcome. S see you all again.